high-risk patient. In this case, it's an 81-year-old gentleman, 10 years post-lung transplant on cyclosporin, Celsep, prednisone, and in fact, uh, dapsone as well. How can dermoscopy help during most surgery, before reconstructive surgery, or even before most surgery is even indicated? As this patient will demonstrate all three benefits. This patient was first treated conservatively with dermal excision and EDNC about five to seven years ago and was last biopsied showing persistent squamous cell approximately one year ago. He was then finally referred for Mohs surgery in May of this year, 2012, after the conservative therapy several times had failed to cure this slow-growing invasive tumor. This is a picture of the tumor that's shown here, ulcerated and nodular, and a broader view as well. There was no clinical adenopathy. This is the uh, episcopic view showing uh, this large keratin plug with uh, various other uh, vascular features and a strawberry-like appearance at, that has been described uh, for uh, features of squamous cell carcinoma. The area was initially debulked with a uh, scalpel and uh, you can see at the base of this debulking area there is still obvious tumor and so we actually debulked it a second time prior to taking our first uh, Mohs layer and then processed both of the debulking specimens by fr fresh fr frozen vertical uh, sections revealing relatively well differentiated squamous cell carcinoma however there was a lot of acantholysis as well and continuing to look at some further views. This is actually a deeper debulk where the tumor is shown down to the base where the blue dye is present uh, of this vertical section. We can see the tumor is fairly aggressive and it's still extensively infiltrating the area. So one layer of Mohs surgery was removed as shown here and the tissue was processed and the top half of the section showed persistent tumor <laughs> in the first layer of Mohs surgery with squamous cell carcinoma as seen here and here which is just a blown up view of the same specimen and then the second bottom half of the Mohs uh, sections revealed some tumor cells as well in one small area of squamous cell adjacent to what I believe is a nerve although uh, I don't think this is perineural invasion it's just incidental uh, tumor closely approximating a nerve so a second layer of Mohs surgery was taken overlapping the area of positivity and this layer at its depth and periphery were actually actually completely clear in fact there was also no evidence of perineural invasion throughout that specimen nor was there evidence of perineural inflammation. So after the second layer, uh, tumor-free peripheral margin as well as the deep margin, but however, prior to reconstruction, we did a dermatoscopic scan uh, of the surrounding field and we found uh, some suspicious areas that uh, were not just basic damage, but even beyond uh, that which needed to be cleared prior to reconstruction. In fact, right around 12 o'clock, just at 11.30. So in fact, right at 11.30, there was this slightly keratotic lesion. Perhaps under the dermatoscope, it appeared to be either hypertrophic actinic keratosis or it could possibly be uh, squamous in situ. And then from 6, around 7 to 7.30, there were actually two uh, nodular pearly areas seen uh, by scanning, which were suspicious for basal cell carcinoma. So again, this is the area just adjacent to 12 o'clock under the dermatoscope shows this hyperkeratotic, slightly scaly uh, area. And we removed that prior to reconstruction of this broader defect and then we'll look at the other two areas underneath. This, again, uh, here's the pathology, uh, which is pretty much just actinic keratosis, maybe with some focal bowenoid dysplasia, and that was cleared by simple dermal excision, and then 
around 6 o'clock was this pearly nodular area that was also biopsied and dermally excised and found to be an early nodular basal cell carcinoma in the last area. The 730 area was again a similar picture of a separate primary basal cell carcinoma which we were able to uncover by simply scanning the field with our dermatoscope and removing and clearing prior to our ultimate reconstruction. And these are all the slides that were actually prepared for that one patient, including the first, the second layer of Mohs, as well as the dermal saucerized excisions of the other three suspicious areas that were mentioned. And so this combined area of defect or the combination of the defects were then widely undermined and an adjacent uh, tissue rearrangement was then done and ultimately a small central full thickness skin graft was placed to uh, cover uh, and reconstruct this, this defect. So then the next question is one month follow up do, doing relatively well. Uh, question is, why did this tumor grow to such a large size in the first place since he had been under a doctor's care and treated every six months for at least the past five to seven years? Well, my question is, if this was conservatively treated and it's slowly grown over that time, what is the chance that given a similar, possibly a similar type of of tumor in this immunocompromised patient in particular, uh, if it's not treated properly initially, could there be a chance that this could also end up uh, looking like something like this down the road? So again, here is a smaller, uh, very subtle, somewhat indeterminate looking lesion. And as we look at it through our dermatoscope, uh, we see a central uh, keratotic uh, sort of area that if you uh, mess with it with your fingers and palpate, there is actually a palpable area. And so in this case, I think it's best to simply take a dermal excision and ensure that you uh, go deep enough to see actually what's happening. And in this case, we have acanthosis, some dis dyskeratosis, and some early evolving squamous cell carcinoma in situ with some appendageal uh, involvement as well. So the attempt to freeze this hyperkeratotic, somewhat thickened papule failed because it was tried one other time. And there's a chance if the same habit of treatment in such a conservative fashion were to be continued over a long period of time, perhaps the uh, possibility of ending up uh, with a large invasive squamous cell carcinoma certainly does exist and I think this pattern uh, has been seen in some of the uh, patients that have been referred to me uh, by others. Uh, now other considerations. Due to the long-standing duration of this tumor in this immunocompromised patient uh, should we consider post-op XRT and what are some of the factors to consider uh, specifically in his case. Well, in fact, he is an elderly gentleman on oxygen after lung transplant. Uh, somewhat frail, but nonetheless, he could have many years ahead of him. And uh, there certainly is a high risk for him developing uh, either parotid involvement or uh, lymph node uh, spread. So perhaps it's 20%, perhaps 30, maybe is up upwards of 40%. This particular squamous cell, however, was relatively slow growing, relatively well differentiated, and there was no clinical evidence of any palpable nodes or uh, parotid mass. And his second layer was uh, very, very clear looking and no evidence of perineural invasion or perineural inflammation. So perhaps he will do well, but I think the consensus is that uh, he probably should have uh, XRT. So how did dermoscopy help us? Uh, during most surgery, it always helps me to delineate my margin. Uh, some of these margins are rather subtle uh, by my naked eye examination. 
and the dermatoscope helps me outline the tumor initially and then even though the peripheral margins were clear uh, prior to reconstruction I like to uh, sort of evaluate the field and scan the field with the dermatoscope to see if uh, we're going to be mobilizing any tissue. The last thing we want to do is is take some uh, uh, a second primary and put it into the area that we're trying to repair. And lastly, uh, if we're careful to uh, evaluate our patients and scan them, particularly our high-risk patients with a dermatoscope, I think we'll find that uh, we can find small nodular tumors that need uh, nothing more than a conservative excision and we can uh, avert the need for even.